Um, so I'll do a, a, just a quick introduction. Um, my name is Bruce Hilborn. Um, I work at the Region of Waterloo in the Transportation Division. I am facilitating the background of Zoom, clicking away, hopefully, to make it all work smooth for us. Um, for Camille's presentation um, with respect to the community fridge. There's, I'm not gonna go huge into a bio or anything like that because I'll direct everyone to HOVA. There is, uh, if you go to the attendees part on the left um, and search his name, you'll see a bio about himself and then as well as about the presentation. If you need a recap, a quick recap of what you just watched, if you get, uh, if, you, if your pencil breaks halfway through from taking notes like mine sometimes does, mm -hmm. um, it's another good spot. We'll, uh, we'll both be watching the chat, so feel free to shoot any questions in there and we can uh, address them. And also don't be shy if you want to turn your camera on. There's only, uh, there isn't 150 people here. I don't think the bandwidth will kill us. So we can, we can actually give him some, some looks and some thumbs up when he's uh, giving a presentation here. Um, did I miss anything? Does that make sense? Perfect. Okay, it's all yours. I will uh, mute myself and go to the back. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thanks everyone for coming out today. Yeah, if you'd like to turn your video uh, on, feel free to. Always happy to see faces, but if you don't want to, no pressure. Um, you know, it's a very low stake environment, especially when I'm involved. It's very informal um, and we're here to just have a good conversation, especially in a breakout session. So thank you, Leadership Waterloo Region, for having me and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, so I wanted to get started with this quote. Um, and I'll let you folks read it, and I'll also read it out for accessibility reasons. The place to look for care is in the dense relationships of local neighbors and their community groups. Uh, so we won't dive too deep into this quote, but I wanted to begin with this quote because it really uh, does inspire a lot of the operating principles behind our organization called the Community Fridge KW, uh, which is the organization through which we will be looking at the last year and a half or year and a bit um, in the next hour or so. So. Um, like Bruce said, my name is Kamal. I'm really happy to be here uh, on behalf of Community Fridge KW. And the title of this presentation or breakout session is called The Abundant Community Collaboration Amidst Crisis. Uh, and so before I get started, just a really, really brief cap about me. I know you'll find more information about myself in the Hoover profile, but uh, a lot, like a lot of people, I came to Waterloo for school. I went to Wilfrid Laurier University, fell in love with the region, found my purpose in the city. Uh, and, you know, found my community as well, and that's what kept me here. So really happy to be here today to be talking about this topic. Um, if you have any questions, concerns, comments throughout the presentation, feel free to interrupt me. Feel free to use the chat function. Feel free to message Bruce. Uh, whatever works best for you will respond uh, when we get a chance to have a look at it. But before we get started, how's everyone feeling? Take a quick check in with yourself. If you've got your camera on, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. If you don't have your camera on, just give it to your computer either way. Um, if you're feeling down here, hopefully by the end of this today, you'll, you'll be up here. But if you're feeling up here, let's hope you can stay up there. Um, but I'm going to get started now. So one of, my, one of the biggest lessons that I've taken forward from you know, university, also in my personal life, and brought forward into this project is this lesson around falling in love with the problem and not your solution. Uh, and what I mean by that is you know, not glamorizing the problems or the systemic issues that you're trying to address, but really being obsessed with the problems that you're hoping to solve as opposed to your solutions that you believe is the correct solution. I think for a lot of us who come from traditional project management backgrounds or you know, have any sort of experience in group dynamics, whether that's a team project at school um, or you know, uh, something we did in the community, we often find ourselves feeling very close uh, and connected with the solution that we've come up with because we're so excited about the problems that it'll solve. But for me, it's really about falling in love with the problem uh, and thinking about the problem more often than the solution because the problem comes first, frankly, let's be honest, as it should. Uh, so I wanted to start with the presentation with creating, uh, doing some sense of problematization. Um, I wanted to articulate some of the problems that our organization hopes to solve, but also bring you folks into the project uh, by starting with those problems that I think everybody can resonate with. So the first thing that you know, the Community Fridge KW hopes to tackle is food insecurity. And we'll get into a bit of how we do that, but I just wanna start with the problems at hand. Um, you know, before the pandemic, we knew that one in eight households across Canada experienced food insecurity in the last year before the pandemic. 
And we also knew that 10% of households in the Waterloo region struggled to put food on the table. And that's from 2019. That's from the region of Waterloo statistics in 2019. So that's pre-pandemic. And you, know, you add the pandemic in there and the Waterloo Food Bank uh, predicted a 30% increase in need over the last year. So you know, we can look at those statistics, but also as people on the ground, we knew that food insecurity was a very real, very uh, hard reality in our communities. You know, uh, whether you are um, a street, part of the street population and are experiencing food insecurity on a systemic level, or you're a student like myself, who at times we experienced food insecurity because exam season was tough and money was short. And, you know, that's something that we really want to drive home through the organization that the concept of need or food insecurity for us is not limited to this long-term experience. You can simply be experiencing hunger a certain afternoon and to us, you're food insecure uh, because food is an essential. You know, there shouldn't be a time limit uh, that you have to go without it for people to understand you as needing support. Uh, so we knew food insecurity was a very real problem in our community and we started with that. The second one that we, you know, hope to tackle and look at often is food waste. Uh, and, I, and it's strange to be looking at this in the time of a pandemic, but you know, we'll talk a little bit about how we have looked at it and how we've been a bit radical. Uh, but based on the avoidable food crisis report in 2019, Canada was losing 58% of its food produced in the country every year across the value chain. And that cost the economy over $49 billion each year. That's a significant amount of loss for food that we're producing that could otherwise be rescued. More particularly, we know that 32% of that amount of food that's being wasted or 11.2 million tons could be easily rescued and saved to support communities across Canada. And these are statistics before the pandemic. So we'll add more problems as we go on through the story. But you know, if you just think about it before the pandemic, these problems were very real. And if those statistics aren't enough for you, the average Canadian household spends about $1,766 a year on food that's wasted. So even if you come down to the individual level, it's quite nasty, uh, the problem of food waste. So uh, that was a very real problem that we coupled with food insecurity. The third problem at hand that we kind of introduced is social isolation. Um, you know, I don't even need to share a lot of statistics about this for people to recognize this as a real problem, obviously as a result of the pandemic. But even before the pandemic, you know, from the 2008, 2009 Canadian Community Health Survey, 525,000 people across Canada, which is 12%, age 65 or older, felt isolated, which meant that they felt removed or separated from their communities at any given time. And if we hone into the Waterloo region and focus on our context specifically, based on the Waterloo Wellbeing 2019 survey, 19.1% of people across the region said that they felt isolated from others in the community. That is a high enough number for us to recognize that as a problem and know that that's something that we need to be looking at uh, in any sort of organization that we're creating because it doesn't have to be about food or shelter for it to be a matter of people uh, and people are experiencing social isolation, period. The fourth problem that we introduce is COVID-19, which is not just one single problem. It is the acceleration, you know, the deterioration of all of these problems that we've already addressed, they've all been accelerated, they've all been uh, taken to the next level. And so I won't even share statistics because we've all lived through this together. Um, but you just know that food insecurity has become deeper. Food waste has gone even further because of hyper anti-sharing. Uh, social isolation has increased however many fold because people are at home and unable to interact with the community. And then you add you know, other toxic uh, parts of the equation like unemployment and uh, you know, not being able to pay rent and lack of social support systems and the social services are no longer open. So you know, add COVID-19 to the mix and you've just got a nasty chemical brew uh, of things that threaten the livelihood of the most vulnerable in our communities. Um, so those are the four major problems that I wanted to begin with and I wanted to introduce the topic by problematizing those uh, before we move into understanding what mutual aid is. So we've been saying since we've op since we began as an organization that we are a mutual aid organization, but we recognize that, you know, there's a learning curve there. Mutual aid is not a super common term, at least not as common as the word charity. Uh, and so there's a little bit of an education curve there. So to provide you with some basic fundamental understanding, here's a definition of mutual aid that's very high level. Um, and I'll read it out. Mutual aid is a collective effort to meet the community's needs 
usually with the understanding that the existing power structures are not meeting those needs. Uh, and this definition comes from Dean Spade, who is uh, an advocate in this space and as well as an academic in this space. Uh, and there's a few parts of this definition that I'd like folks to kind of think about. You know, at the most fundamental level, mutual aid is simply neighbors coming together to solve neighborhood issues without the involvement of authority or central figures like government or police. Uh, if you were to take a minute, and I highly, highly encourage you to do so, and think about examples that you can come up with of mutual aid, they're all around you. Uh, you know, to give a couple examples in this space to share, um, neighbors in, in the pandemic grabbing, you know, uh, prescription medication for their seniors on their street because their immunities have been compromised. That is an example of mutual aid. They might not have an Instagram page, but it's mutual aid. Uh, you know, people grabbing extra groceries for someone they know who's struggling, who lost their job, that's mutual aid. Or, you know, neighbor, neighbors coming together to discuss how we might raise funds to solve, you know, uh, a, a traffic light that's causing accidents in the region. That's something that we want to come together to do. That's mutual aid. And obviously community fridges are an example of mutual aid. So to get into what community fridges are, um, I'd like to introduce you to Community Fridge KW first and foremost. Community fridges are a model of mutual aid that have become prevalent across the world, but especially Europe and North America in the last five years. They are just one example of mutual aid, one example of grassroots movements working towards community care. Uh, and essentially, in a very easy put way, they're public repositories of fresh donated food that anybody can take from for free at any time uh, with no questions asked and no interrogation or anything like that. That's what they are at the most fundamental levels. They're hoping to tackle that food insecurity piece, uh, address that food waste issue, uh, bring in individuals who are experiencing social isolation. And then when you add COVID-19 to the mix, community fridges become that much more of a radical and monumental uh, piece that address cracks in the system. So I wanted you to meet Community Fridge KW before we talk about the story of how we got started. Um, but that's the first image for you. So I want to take you through our story. I want to I want to share with you how it's happened. I want to share with you the journey. Uh, and like the description said, share with you the good, the bad, the ugly, um, the pains, the you know opportunities and the highlights, because all of that is part and parcel of our work. Uh, it's not been uh, this, you know, complete perfect trajectory of only successes and achievements. And I think that's just part of doing good community work that you recognize when there are highs and lows and valleys and peaks, and you're consistently looking at the problems presented to you to find solutions. But we're going to start with August 2020, the conception. So in August 2020, my friend Angel and I, who both attended Wilfrid Laurier University, you know, we're seeing the issues that we just presented to you all around us. Uh, we were seeing food insecurity get accelerated. We were seeing food waste. You know, we one of us worked in a restaurant, so we were seeing the effects of you know uh, COVID and hyper anti sharing and hyper cleanliness and the very real issue of food waste. We were also seeing people uh, isolate themselves behind closed doors because of the pandemic, because of unemployment, because of uh, health issues and community issues and the lack of social services that were available. There was a lot of siloing happening around around the region. Um, and we wanted to do something about it and we wanted to respond and we were inspired by the movement that's been happening across Europe and North America. You know, at the time that we were getting started, Toronto had just placed their fourth community fridge out. Calgary had just started their first one and Regina was building their first one out as well. So there was a lot of energy in the space. And, you know, when I sometimes people ask me the question of, you know, Kamal, can you think about something good that came out of the pandemic? And it's a very awkward question because it's been such a rough time. But if you had to think about something, I would be I would have to say it's this collective understanding of we need to respond and we need to do something. We all felt that we all felt that at a much um, higher level during the pandemic. We all felt like we were being called upon uh, to the community. And that, that comes with uh, people experiencing the same problems at the same time, neighbors experiencing neighborhood issues and wanting to do something about it. Uh, so the two of us on August 10th sent our first email uh, to businesses and organizations across the region from a Gmail account that we had just created with zero legitimacy and zero funding uh, and zero other po folks involved. It was just the two of us. Uh, we reached out to organizations and businesses to see if they'd be interested in the idea and lo and behold, 15 days later on August 25th, our first community fridge was open at Zero Waste Bulk. 
So in 15 days time, and I know it's, it's crazy to think about now, but in those 15 days, it snowballed. We reached out to you know, businesses and we got a lot of no's, but Zero Waste Bulk, the beloved uh, sustainable grocery store in Uptown Waterloo said yes. Uh, and we only needed that one yes, really. So uh, they had a fridge that they were willing to use and we reached out to public health. We built that partnership, you know, donation guidelines and health regulations came down the pipe. We gained approval from public health officials. Uh, we got some of our friends involved as early volunteers. Uh, and on August 25th, we opened the first community fridge in Kitchener, Waterloo, or the first community fridge that region had ever seen. So to give you a little bit more context, I'm going to share a thorn, a bud, and a rose for each of these pieces of the story. Um, a thorn being something bad, something challenging, something painful, bud being something that was happening, uh, something that was blooming, but was not completely realized yet. And a rose was something that was good, something that did come out of it that was a highlight. So we opened the community fridge on August 25th, which was indoors at Zero Waste Bulk, as you can see, and started calling for donations from the neighborhood. Um, and the thorn here was getting started. I think a lot of community organizers and uh, people who create anything will always vouch to the fact that starting is the hardest part and only gets easier from there. We were two students, two young people at the age of 23 with no titles, no funding, you know, no affiliations just asking businesses in a time of COVID-19 if they would be interested in undertaking a community aid, mutual aid project. Uh, and so getting started was difficult. You know, every day we asked ourselves if this was worth it. Every day we asked ourselves if this actually worked, would we be even able to sustain this? Like we're looking for work and we're graduating school all at the same time too. So um, that was the thorn getting started. The bud or something good that was happening there was a validation of need, you know. I vividly remember um, in the first week of the fridge being open, I was leaving Zero Waste Bulk after making a donation. And um, this individual who most likely called the streets their home was completely just, just struck with the kindness that was available in the community. They had said that they had never experienced something um, like this where they didn't need to ask, where they didn't need to beg, where they weren't police where they weren't monitored, where they could visit as many times as they wanted. Um, and in that moment, it was all worth it. You know, obviously in those moments, you're like, forget the emails and the late night uh, slide deck creations, all of that is worth it. So that validation of need and community buy-in was the bud from this, from this phase of this story. Um, like I said, we got friends involved as early volunteers, but uh, very quickly, people who attended Zero Waste Bulk as just, you know, grocery store visitors wanted to become volunteers as well. So very quickly, we amassed a group of 50 volunteers across the region who were checking in on the fridge every day, you know, taking food from the fridge to folks with disabilities, uh, so on and so forth. So, and the rose out of this, or the really positive piece, was the proof of concept. So, um, you know, after a lot of ideation and brainstorming and researching and reaching out to community partners, seeing people actually take food from the fridge was like, that's it. That's, this is all we ever needed and all we could ever ask for. So that was the rose in, that, in the August 2020 conception period. The next chapter of our story that we'll be walking through together is December 2020, the build. So in November of 2020, our pilot at Zero Waste Bulk started to come to a close. Uh, our partners at Zero Waste Bulk wanted to regain access to their fridge, and we knew that the 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 fridge at Zero Waste Bulk was not going to be long term. Um, you know, something that I was saying from the very beginning for the project was I want this to be zero barriers to entry, and having a fridge that's in a business that's you know only open during operating hours that's a barrier right there. Uh, I also recognize that Zero Waste Bulk is not the average citizen's uh, grocery store. There is privilege associated with accessing sustainable goods. So there was another barrier. Um, there's staff that obviously have to work in the store, even though they may not have any ill intention or um, malice, the individual feels like they might be policed or surveilled, and that's a barrier to entry. So we always knew that this is going to be outdoors. And as the pilot came to a close, it was an awesome opportunity to get that started. So we wanted to start pushing forward on that zero barriers to access piece. And once again, we were back to square one, reaching out to organizations and businesses that might be interested. Obviously we had developed some legitimacy and some understanding across the region. So we did have that to leverage. Um, 
Full Circle Foods, which is a beloved grocery store in downtown Kitchener, came on board. Uh, and what we really appreciate about that partnership is they're grounded in the community. They are right there in the middle of it all. They see it, you know, day and night. Uh, and they are also committed to that type of work. They understand it's radical. They understand it's going to be challenging. They understand there will be days when uh, we might have to problem solve and it won't always be easy. And so we were really excited about that partnership. We started to call for, you know, it, we now had a location. We needed to find a fridge, which was the next step. Uh, I was looking at Kijiji. We didn't have any funding, mind you. Um, and we really didn't want to get funding. We didn't want to fundraise from the community because this was a mutual aid project and we wanted to leverage the community's existing resources and skills. So we just started to call out for a fridge um, on social media, incredibly powerful. And lo and behold, a neighbor named Austin Kennedy reached out and said, hey, I've got a fridge, I want you to have it. And I'm gonna deliver it for you as well. And obviously, once again, these moments of like, it's all worth it because you're getting that validation of community buy-in and you're also getting uh, neighbors from all sorts of walks of life come into the project because you've opened it up for them to do so. So Austin dropped off this fridge. Now we had a location and a fridge, but it was about to be winter. And the fridge was sitting outside in a parking lot. So it was time to build a shelter. You know, I was looking at sheds that home hardware might like to donate. I was looking at outhouses that we could reuse. Um, it was a lot of research. And eventually I realized that I was doing it all in here and not as much out here. So I just started reaching out to people in my network that I was working on this project and if they had any insights. I reached out to a professor of mine at Wilfrid Laurier who's also a mentor named Steven Svensson. Uh, and Stephen has a lot of experience in the community doing really great work. He's had experience building tiny homes, uh, building chicken farms, so on and so forth. Um, I brought Stephen in and Stephen said, you know what? I've got a location, my driveway, and I've got tools, everything that you could possibly need. Why don't you build a shed with me? And we'll sketch it out and we can use the Patchworks model, which he introduced me to. And the Patchworks model is essentially building a tiny home in panels. So it can be deconstructed and rebuilt anywhere at any time. And I, I, I definitely remember crying uh, in those days because it was just so much. It was like researching for a shed, reaching out, and then all of a sudden your problems are instantly solved because you brought someone into the project because they brought their resources, their skills, and their gifts in. So Stephen came on board and it was just about to be December. It had already snowed. I started to reach out to Home Hardware. I started to reach out to other partners that might like to donate materials. Uh, and CBC wanted to do a uh, story on us on the first day of the build, on the first Saturday that we got together. And that day was just to sketch out the design uh, and to find some materials around the region. CBC came by and did a story on us. And let me tell you, that story blew up in the best way possible. We had people from around the region reaching out to donate wood, their reclaimed wood, their pallets, screws and nails, their labor, uh, you know, their skills, marketing skills, anything, you name it, people were starting to reach out and the messages were just pouring in. And, and we hadn't even put a call out. We hadn't even, you know, asked for wood. We had just said that we're working on this project for the community and that everybody is invited to join in any ways that they can. And I remember going with Stephen to pick up, you know, wood pallets from this gentleman who just had a bunch of wood pallets in his garage. And I remember going to um, an old ax throwing place, which is closed down now to pick up a bunch of plywood that we used to build the door. And then we built a partnership with Home Hardware because they saw us on TV and they wanted a piece and they gave us screws and nails to, for, the, for, the, for the shelter build. So we had everything we needed. And over the course of four weekends in December, with complete volunteer labor and volunteer gifts and skills, we built the shelter with our bare hands um, and we used zero dollars to do it. Um, and so near the end of December, the shelter was constructed. It was sitting in Stephen's driveway um, and we eventually got it to Full Circle Foods a couple of days before the opening. And we opened the fridge on December 21st, 2020 and it served its first customer two minutes after. Um, and that's kind of the story of December 2020, the build. The picture you see in front of you is from day two of the build out of four days. Um, and that's Edna on the left, Sarah in the middle, uh, Nick and myself on the right. And Stephen is, you know, hunching in the shelter itself. 
Uh, we, we kept our distance. We worked with public health to get that approved to make sure we know how many people are out there at a certain time. Um, and we had different volunteers every weekend who were involved and, you know, they were students, they were senior citizens, they were of all ages and walks of life. Um, and it was really awesome to see. So a thorn from this story um, or the negative piece or the challenge was resistance. You know, any sort of change, any sort of radical change, any sort of uh, creation of something new will come with resistance. And we expected it, we anticipated it, uh, but we obviously didn't uh, anticipate exactly where it came from. And for us to be completely honest and transparent with you folks, because we've been transparent about everything else, um, the resistance came from local institutions who felt that they 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 own this work. They felt that they own this work of uh, filling the cracks of food insecurity and food waste. And you know we were really open to collaboration, and we had to kind of stick to our guns and uh, remind ourselves that we're here to do this work. We're not here to you know make our claim to fame or get our names out there. We're here to just simply do the work. And if folks are interested in joining us and doing the work, we're more than happy to get involved. Uh, and if they don't want to, that's fine. We'll. We'll all continue to do our separate efforts and hopefully find ways to collaborate in the future. Uh, but that resistance piece was challenging because we're, frankly, we're a bunch of young people uh, with no legitimacy formally um, and no you know, formal organization. If someone doesn't love what we're doing and has a problem with it, they could find ways to stop us. Um, but luckily that didn't happen. We you know, did our best to be uh, diplomatic and we did our best to be engaging of the community and uh, that was just a thorn, but we've moved on from there. A bud during this time was buzz. Like I said, CBC got on board and we didn't reach out to them. They just heard from the community that we were doing this bill. We had put out the word for a fridge, uh, especially in the middle of a pandemic when you know a bunch of young people are asking for a fridge. Uh, I think people will notice. Um, but there was a lot of buzz around the region, which was great. And the final piece, the rose or the really great strong point out of this chapter was uh, the community buy-in, you know, right off the bat on the very first day, we had businesses ready to come donate food. We had organizations ready to spread the word to their, to the folks that they serve who are already vulnerable people. For example, the pregnancy center came on very early on uh, and they wanted to spread the word to their constituency as well as individuals, you know, whether they're donors uh, out of their backyard, people were donating food very early on or their users, you know, while we were building the shed, I remember folks walking up to us on the driveway and saying, hey, what is this? Hey, can I access food here? It was a crazy experience. And um, I think that just comes with putting yourself out there in the community and accepting your role as, uh, as you know, service. Um, and once you, once you uh, kind of commit to that, uh, people won't be shy to ask you for support. And that's exactly what we want. So that was the rose that we saw community buy and across the board. The final chapter of our story is present day, the operations. So I won't get into the nitty gritty um, because we're gonna talk about that in just a moment, but just to give you a high level understanding of where we're at, we've got 250 volunteers across the region who are taking care of the fridge, who are taking care of food rescue, who are delivering hampers, who are checking in on the fridge to disinfect it, uh, who are taking care of marketing, who are taking care of outreach and building food partnerships. Um, and there's a lot of good stuff happening that we'll talk about in just a moment. But the thorn here out of this chapter was that change comes with a curve. Uh, and once again, to be completely transparent and open with you folks, because this is you know, a conversation about uh, solving problems, the problem that has come out of this present day chapter uh, is the need for education. We recognize that mutual aid is a departure from how folks have given in the past. Charity or you know, the model of giving that we're all most familiar with and inherent to it is a power differential. It involves a vertical movement of power from top to bottom. Someone has something. So they're giving it to someone who doesn't. There is just an inherent power imbalance there. Mutual aid is works on a horizontal plane. There is no power imbalance. It consistently moves from left to right. We recognize that there will be times when we have the ability to give and there will be times when we need to take. Uh, and that's part of being human and recognizing our role as neighbors. Uh, and that's, there's no power differential. It's sharing across this horizontal pain. So that is a departure, like I said, from how we've been, been giving. So for example, once again, being completely honest with you folks, folks in the past might have typically given to a food bank, you know, a monetary donation. The food bank then makes the decision of how that money is used and will equitably distribute that funding through its, the folks that it serves. 
flip that on its head and through a mutual aid project and introduce a community fridge. Someone wants to give to the community fridge. We don't accept monetary donations. You want to give something, go to the fridge and drop off some food. They go to the bridge to drop off some food. And right off the bat, they're meeting the individual who's going to be using that food. There is no separation. There is no power separation. They meet that individual right there. They can be conflict. And there has been conflict as a result of that dynamic. And, you know, that conflict can look like that's not enough food for me. Or I don't know if you need all that amount of food. Um, and there's, you know, various aspects of policing and there's various aspects of surveillance that are involved. And all of that reminds us that there's an educational curve here. Um, this is different. This is a different way of giving. This is a different way of community care. And we see that. We see that every day. Uh, but we also see people struggling with their internal biases to be able to do this work. You know, we see and have conversations with neighbors who are grappling with the fact that this is a very different model of giving. You know, even fridge users that we talk to on a daily basis, they'll recognize that it's a mutual aid project and say, you know, I didn't get a whole lot of food today, but I have to understand that there will be more food tomorrow. It's not like a food bank where they can request it a certain amount of time later. They can come later that night and there will be more food there. But once again, that's a, that's a change in behavior that requires a change in perspective. Uh, and so that's one of the, that's the thorn here is that there's a curve and we're, we're tackling that every day. Um, and, you know, we're doing education to the community, we're walking with the community, we're, you know, reminding folks that we don't police, we don't collect data, we don't surveil our, our neighbors. Um, and it really is a radical understanding of community care. It will take time for people to understand that and for, to come fully on board. But we know we're on the track because people are grappling with themselves. Uh, and that is what I would say is the bud. So we're seeing folks grapple with themselves and their spirits. We're seeing people grapple with their conditionings. Um, and grapple with traditional forms of giving. You know, you don't get a tax receipt from us when you give to us. That's just an, another example of that perspective shift that I'm not actually getting anything out of me giving to the community fridge, besides the fact that I know I've actually created impact. So it's all about that impact piece. Uh, and the last thing that I'll say, the rose out of this or the really great experience is um, we're filling need and we're seeing it every day. Uh, you know, the fridge, for those of us, for those of you who follow us on social media, we post fridge updates three times a day from those daily check-ins that volunteers do. And people can see the food shift and change throughout the day. You know, someone will donate something at 2.30 p.m. and we'll get another update at 3 p.m. and the fridge is empty. We'll see another donation at 4 p.m. and the fridge is full, but by 6 p.m. it's completely empty. We are seeing that need be filled, whether it's by qualitative understandings, like people who message us and say, you know, I fed my daughter broccoli for the first time in two weeks. It's either that or quantitatively, we can see the fridge changing, but we don't collect data on fridge users. So we'll actually never know um, who's taking food for how much, for how many people, how often, and we don't want to know. We, we frankly don't want to know. So that's a little bit of the story of Community Fridge KW. This picture that you see is a gentleman from Swine and Vine, which is a beloved restaurant in the region. Um, and this is them making a donation to the Community Fridge uh, with some of the food that they have from their inspected kitchen. So I just said a lot of words. I'm gonna let them steep into you in a minute. But the result of these three chapters of our story come to one conclusion. And that conclusion is that innovation or the introduction of problem solving, innovation to us is just the introduction of something new, the creation of something new, a problem that's been solved that was not solved previously. Innovation is the product of meaningful collaboration. You know, if you think about every chapter that I just shared with you and the rose, bud, and thorn of each chapter, collaboration was embedded in every single piece of it, whether it was at the conception stage when it was just Angel and I reaching out to people on cold calls and cold emails. And we finally got someone who said yes. And we collaborated with them to get the community fridge started. And we collaborated with local partners to get donations into the fridge. Or it was at the second story of the fridge when it was the build, when collaboration was at its most highest. Uh, and not to mention most highest during the most peak of the pandemic, let alone. So, um, you know, people coming together to share resources, share gifts, share abilities. All of that was collaboration to create the, create the shelter and get the fridge open, um, or it's present day operation. It's consistent collaboration, not only with food partners who are donating to the fridge and you know, organizations that are promoting it, but also with the, food, the folks that are using it. You know, 
while we don't collect data, if they ever reach out, we always have a conversation about how we can adjust, how we can respond, how we can better serve. Uh, and that to us is also an example of collaboration. We're collaborating with those that we seek to serve because this is about them. It's not about us. It's not about an awesome idea that we had that we are absolutely adamant on installing. It's about solving problems and that requires collaboration. So collaboration amidst crisis at its most, uh, you know, highest form. But how did that happen or how do we do that on a day-to-day -day basis? I've introduced to you the four problems that we've had and now I wanna walk you through the four solutions that we co-created with and for the community. So the first problem that we looked at was food insecurity and the solution that we created with the community is zero barrier food access. And to us, zero barriers means 24 seven, which is the fridge, it's open 24 seven, zero data collection, no questions asked when you take food or when you donate food, but there is a donor log for contact tracing form for contact tracing purposes, but still zero barrier access. Um, it's open anytime and donations come at all times. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be in the daytime. We know a lot of our community members, especially as the weather gets better, have need at nighttime. Uh, and the fact that they can access free food at night is a zero barrier. So um, that was the solution to that, that we co-created food sharing and re food rescue. The second problem that we had looked at was food waste. Um, and so we worked with the community to find ways that we can rescue this food and we can share this food through the community fridge. So obviously individuals donate to the fridge from their extra, from their grocery trips and from the food that they grow in their backyards. Uh, but we also have businesses that we built partnerships with, Swine and Vine, Cafe Puris, um, Full Circle Foods, the list goes on. I can't even remember the list now. Um, Ace, Ace Shawarma and Burgers, there's several. There's several food partners that are donating food to the fridge from their kitchens that would have otherwise been wasted or thrown away. Uh, that's one way that we're saving food. Uh, but we're also building partnerships to rescue food. So for example, we've offered this service to the community and businesses across the community that if they ever have food that is going bad or is about to go bad or that they will throw away, all they need to do is reach out to us and one of our volunteers will go pick that food up and deliver it to the fridge. And the turnaround time at the fridge is less than an hour. So we know that that food will get used immediately um, and it won't be sitting in someone's pantry for additional days. So we, we do food rescues every week from across the region. People send us an email or give me a call uh, and I organize a volunteer to go make that pickup. So that's food sharing and food rescue. In a time of hyper anti-sharing, um, we figured out ways to work with the community to rescue this food and prevent it from going to waste. The third problem that we looked at was social isolation. And my response to that has been multiple points of entry. And what I mean by that is that the project is completely open. It is not mine. It is not Angel's. It is not ours. It is completely owned by the community. And, you know, we've obviously had to build that through language and intentional design, but there are entry points for people to come into the fridge at any point. Okay, if you're in Kitchener-Waterloo and you want to volunteer, you can volunteer and check in on the fridge. Say you want to volunteer, but you're not in Kitchener-Waterloo. You can help us make cold calls and send cold emails and do marketing. Say you're in Kitchener-Waterloo, you want to volunteer, but you can't leave your house. You can still participate by helping us online or do cold calls and cold outreach. For the donors that want to come in and donate food, you know, if they want to come and drop off food to the fridge, that's great. But if they can't, a volunteer will go and pick up that food, multiple points of entry. For fridge users, they're obviously welcome to come out to the fridge and take food from the fridge. But say they have a disability or say they have an accessibility need or say they can't leave because of COVID, a volunteer will go and deliver a hamper to them. Uh, and we'll also ask them what they need. So it's not just a random things that we're giving them. Say a food partner wants to come on board, but they don't want to donate food to us. They want to donate something else, we will work with them to figure out what else they can donate. For example, our paper towel comes from 10 Spot Downtown Kitchener, the spa in Downtown Kitchener. They wanted to donate something, but they're not a food business. Uh, so they donate paper towel, multiple points of entry. Uh, and, and the list goes on and so on and so forth, right? And very soon we're gonna be inviting volunteers and neighbors to come and paint the fridge. Uh, very soon, we're going to be inviting folks when things get better to have a food drive around the fridge. Multiple points of entry means that there is opportunity at any given time of any given day, regardless of circumstance, for individuals to be part of this project because it's theirs. It's not ours. Uh, and, and it's a constant reminder because if it truly belongs to them, there needs to be a channel that they can get involved through, right? Because it's theirs. 
Uh, so we have to consistently look for multiple points of entry and open those up. And on the flip side, obviously this benefits the community, but it also benefits the project because um, there's only so much that we can do as organizers. There's so much more that we can do as a community when people have access to a project and feel like they are accountable and owner and take ownership over it. The project is automatically self-sustaining because it, it isn't limited to any certain group of people. It belongs to the community that it seeks to serve. So this is both, you know, a vantage for the fridge and also the community. And the final solution is fostering organic relationships. So we had looked at COVID-19 as the final challenge. Um, and our response to that is fostering organic relationships and facilitating connections of support. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, obviously the community fridge is a model of support, is providing people with fresh donated food for free, but we recognize that it's not addressing systemic problems. We're not oblivious or ignorant. Um, and we also recognize that it's only addressing a small portion of challenges that people are feeling in, especially during this time, which is food insecurity uh, and social isolation, let alone other challenges that come with unemployment, having children during this time, being a single parent, you know, losing social services, losing welfare. There's so many other challenges that are, that are very real. Uh, so for us to tackle COVID-19, we need to build those organic relationships amongst neighbors to help each other beyond just the community fridge. So it's not just about food. It's not just about the community fridge. It's about fostering those organic relationships with people from all walks of life who otherwise, you know, if the fridge did not exist, would not have interacted. Uh, through the community fridge, they build these relationships and they build organic understandings of camaraderie and neighbors uh, who are there to help each other out. You know, whether that's they built a connection because a volunteer delivered a hamper to them at some point. And now they chat here and there and the volunteer sends them resources that they can access. That's one example. Or, you know, an individual who comes to the fridge every week and has met one of our food partners. And now the food partner has created a, reg a schedule with them to get food to them directly. So whatever it is, we're fostering organic relationships at the fridge that go way beyond it. And that's how we're addressing COVID-19 um, at a much larger level. So I said a lot of words and, and I'm fasting, so I probably should take a break, but <laughs> we're gonna go right into the learnings. Um, obviously it's been a phenomenal experience and I've only shared so much in the last you know, 45 minutes. Um, and, I, and I wish I could share everything. And if you wanna learn more or wanna hear everything, please feel free to reach out after this. I'm always up for a conversation. Um, but for the sake of this presentation, I did want to share four learnings uh, that I've walked away with, but I've also consistently had to come back to uh, because this job is not a one and done situation, right? Like it's a 24 hour seven uh, gig for me. And when I say gig, I don't mean it's a paid job or anything, but it's something that I think about all the time uh, because all 250 of us, all of us volunteers are thinking about this 24, 24 seven because the fridge is open 24 seven. We are serving our neighbors 24 seven and we're consistently thinking about that. So uh, these are the learnings that I have to keep myself in check with. This is my favorite one and also the one that I have the hardest time with. Um, and I will be the first to admit it as well. For a lot of us who come from traditional project management or corporate you know, experiences or having gone through school and worked in traditional team projects, um, we really want to own things. We really want our name on things. We really, I'm going to say I, I really want my name on things. I want to be known for the work I'm doing. I want people to know that I'm working hard. I want people to know that it's me who's behind this project. I want people to know that I'm the one dedicating all this time. That right there is me drinking ounces and ounces of my own Kool-Aid. Uh, and this was a lesson that I learned from a professor at Laurier named Nicole McCallum, who always said, keep your ego aside, don't drink your own Kool-Aid. And what I mean by the work that you're here to do, the impact that you're striving to create, not the influence. And you know, I have to remind myself of this all the time because if I look good, cool is good, but in the project, here's a very tangible example. When we first got started, you know, that we may want to use and they were taught to be called the founder community for KW. Founder, where does that leave everybody else 
who's taking care of the fridge on a day-to-day -day basis. I just want to make sure you folks can hear me. I think my internet is a little. You're cutting in and out a little bit. Okay, I'm cutting in and out a little bit. I'm just going to turn off everyone's can. videos just so we. There we go. Can we? Yeah, let's just keep your video on Camille and try that. There you go. You're, you're, you're good now. Yeah, everybody yeah. can hear me. I got you there. Perfect. Um, yeah, so let me go back a little bit. So uh, like I was saying, you know, I would have loved to be called founder, but where does that leave everybody else in the project? What role does that leave them with? And if I'm calling myself founder, that means everybody else is below me. There's a power differential there. And the you know negative repercussions of that could be monumental. One of the biggest assets and biggest things that we pride ourselves on is our ability uh, our volunteer capacity and our volunteer mass, 250 people across the region running a project in the middle of a pandemic, that speaks volumes to community ownership and accountability. People are treating the fridge as their own fridge. People are checking in on the fridge even when they're not scheduled. People are stopping by with donations without telling us. People are sending photos of the fridge when we're not expecting it. And that is all the product of people taking ownership and taking accountability and feeling completely equal and involved with the project. Now, had I included that title, maybe all of this would still be true, but it was just a small example of a time that I had to remind myself to not drink my own Kool-Aid. But I have to remind myself of that all the time. You know, even for, even with this presentation, uh, I, my colleague Angel was saying, why is it say organizer at Community Fridge KW and not leader or whatever? And had to remind myself to not drink my own Kool-Aid. And it's not about me. It's not about the influence that I want. It's about the impact that I want to create. The second biggest learning was um, build with those you seek to serve. And I'm always reminded of that quote that just because you build something doesn't mean people will come. You have to build it with people. And it was completely and utterly true with this project. You know, uh, if we just kept the project in ourselves, if I'm to go back to that uh, chapter two, the build December 2020, you know, when I was doing research for the shelter and I was looking at outhouses and sheds that we might be able to purchase or get donated, had I not reached out to the community, had I not opened up the project calling for a fridge, calling for shelter builders, calling for space to build it, it would not have gone the way it did. It would not have snowballed. We would not have built the shelter so quickly and with so much support and spending zero dollars. Um, and that just is a reminder that we need to build with those you seek to serve, not only for the long-term sustainability of the project, but also for the success of the project. You know, if it's all up in here in my brain and then I open it up when I'm ready to, there are so many variables that I have not accounted for. Um, I have been the only uh, um, re survey respondent during that time. I'm the only one validating everything that we're thinking about. But when you open the project, every step of the way you're receiving validation or challenge uh, and every step of the way you're problem solving. So when you get to the end, it's ready to work as opposed to getting to the end and then having to think about how we need to change or what we should have done better. So build with those you seek to serve and they will be part of it from the beginning. The third challenge is around understanding people's skills, abilities, um, and resources as gifts. And this is something that Joe and Stephanie Mancini, who are the creators of the Working Center, actually talk about in their book uh, called The Transition to Common Work. Um, and they talk about understanding people's skills, the gift, the resources that they're able to bring, their proficiencies, their resources as gifts. And when we're able to kind of shift our perspective into understanding people as bringing gifts, we then find a value and a spot for each and every individual. You know, you don't have a car and traditional understandings of volunteering that might be, okay, you can't actually volunteer with us. But if we're focusing on gifts and we're having a conversation around gifts, we have to explore what else they might have. They don't have a car, but through a conversation, we learn that they have an immense and a very powerful network and they don't need a car to gain, you know, the buy-in from their whole street. And now the whole street is doing a food drive and donating to the fridge every month. Uh, and that is a person's gift. They didn't have anything tangible. They didn't have anything physical or monetary, uh, but that skill, their ability, their resource, their network, that is a gift that they're sharing with us. Uh, and when we understand people's skills, abilities, and resources as gifts, we never say no to them because you're not gonna say no to a gift, come on. 
who says no to gifts? Um, so that's kind of a perspective shift. And that's allowed us to have that 250 plus volunteer base, allowed us to work so fast uh, and allowed us to be so responsive of the community. And finally, um, this one's on my bulletin board. Actually, all of these are on my bulletin board, but this one's in bigger letters somewhere. Um, it's better to do it well than to do it big. You know, I studied social entrepreneurship at school. I know uh, the concept of scaling very well. I know how often it comes up in business planning. And it's come up often even in the community fridge. You know, people always say, uh, you're doing so well. The project is doing so well. Why don't you open a bunch of new community fridges? Or you know, uh, your fridge should be bigger or you need to get registered as an organization or, you know, apply for all these funding. And absolutely, it's great ideas. They're not bad ideas. Um, they're just not grounded in the present moment. And I have to remind myself that it's better to do it well than to do it big. Uh, we could easily open three more community fridges in the next month, but I know for a fact that we would lose our ability to check in on it every single day. We would lose the strength of our food partnerships. We would probably lose some of that buy-in from communities that have completely focused on this fridge. So we're focused on doing it well, as opposed to doing it big. Uh, and that is also part and parcel with, you know, responding to problems. It, it, if we thought this was just a fantastic idea that we were adamant on installing, yeah, we might install four community fridges because we think it's a great idea. But we're here to respond to need and we're here to create impact. Uh, and so we'll open another community fridge when the neighbors, when the community says, we need a community fridge in this area, let's talk about that. So um, we're four months into our outdoor fridge. We obviously have had a lot of conversations about the future, but we're focused on doing it well. We, we know we're serving our neighbors right now. We're gonna continue serving our neighbors uh, continue focusing on addressing food waste, food insecurity in our region, social isolation. Uh, and as things get better in terms of COVID, um, other problems like food insecurity and food waste will not disappear. They will not evaporate. And those problems existed before the pandemic and they will exist after. So we know that we're constantly going to be adjusting and listening to the community to adapt to the needs. Uh, and I'm super excited about that. Even if I'm not involved with the project, which I probably won't be because I have to I know I have to make an exit at some point for this project to last however long the community wants it to last, because if I'm associated with it for too long, it will become my project. Um, and, you know, every step of the way right now is about building capacity uh, and thinking about the long term sustainability. So with that, I want to say thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on this journey of uh, problematizing, exploring the problems and discussing how we created solutions with and for the community uh, in a time of great crisis, but uh, through the crisis was born immense collaboration. So thank you so much for your time. And I'm going to leave you with this quote before we go into questions. Do you have any questions? I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you so much. That was really well done. I learned a lot. So thank you for sharing oh, with us. Um, yeah, one question I had is uh, something from my experience, like working in the restaurant industry, something that I've heard a lot about. Um, I'm not really sure kind of the legalities around it, but I've heard a lot of hesitancy from restaurants and grocery stores to donate uh, food due to liability issues. And yeah. I was wondering if that was something you encountered along the journey at all. And if so, how, uh, how you face that obstacle and maybe got around it. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's absolutely true. You know, when we were, especially early days, like I said, when we had no legitimacy and no one, no one knew of us, um, we were reaching out to grocery stores and restaurants and we were getting the odd message like, 
who are you? Like, why would we give you food? Like, this makes zero sense. Where is the, you know, risk evaluation? Where is the liability uh, profile? Where is the insurance involved? And, you know, we had a conversation with us as a group and said, hey, are we going to come up with answers to all of these and do our research and, you know, get registered as an organization so we can respond to these and can have those types of, um, uh, you know, um, capacities? Or do we accept the fact that we're a mutual aid grassroots organization that's working at the very ground level? We're a bunch of neighbors helping neighbors out. And that's the, that's the pitch that we went with. And a lot of businesses love it, understand it, recognize their role in it, and they share food with us. Uh, but there are times like, you know, we can't really get donations from Sobeys because they have their own policies around that. So we recognize that there is a win and a loss there. Um, the win is that we are grassroots level and we have neighbors and local businesses coming out and showing their support. And as a result of that, neighbors are supporting those local businesses that are supporting the fridge. Um, but the loss there is that we can't accept donations from everyone because there are issues of um, you know, health and safety that they might not comply with, even though we have approval from public health. Um, that's just something that we've had to kind of stick to our guns with that we're grassroots, we're mutual aid, uh, and there is no formal understanding of risk and insurance and liability at this level. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Emily, great question. Emily says, if the neighborhood I work in Cambridge is interested in exploring a community fridge, where should I start the conversation? We are shifting as an organization to encourage neighbors to have conversations and it has started around community gardens. Absolutely. So, you know, a promise that we took on after the community fridge, after we built our community fridge is that we would help others do the same. Uh, because when we were starting out, we were working with Regina and Calgary and Toronto who were all providing us with resources and best practices. Um, and we wanted to return that favor. So we've actually had conversations from people in Peterborough, Burlington and Guelph uh, and Cambridge to start community fridges in those cities. Um, I believe there's, a, there's an organization called the 509 Community Collective that's working on community fridges in Cambridge. So I would definitely connect with the 509 Community Collective on that because I think they've started with some pantries. Uh, but in terms of where you should start the conversation, I would start the conversation with whoever's around you. You know, you can always get more people involved, but start the conversation. It's better to just get started. Uh, and even with two, three people, you might you know, realize that you have skills, abilities, and resources uh, that you didn't know you had. You know, someone on your small group of people might have a network, and in that network, there might be a local business who might be willing to host that fridge. So um, just get started, get started, and let the ball start rolling, and don't be afraid to put yourself out there. It was super intimidating to reach out to local businesses um, with the handle communityfridgekw at gmail.com uh, and asking for them to host a fridge, but, you know, we had to. We had to do that to hear those no's and to get that feedback, and we had to, to hear that one yes. So um, just get started wherever you are. Yeah, I uh, love the idea of it's better to do it well than to do it big, me too, as well as taking advantage of the different skills volunteers bring. Absolutely, keeping both of these in mind and being creative with volunteer skills. Do you have future goals on how to keep improving the current fridge? Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, we're always responding to need. And as the weather gets warmer, the dynamics of the fridge are changing. We're seeing more people visit the fridge at nighttime, um, which means that we are calling for donations at nighttime where we weren't before. We are seeing more people hang around the fridge because the weather's better. So we've created new language for our volunteers to use when they're doing check-ins around, you know, not loitering around the fridge, but also making sure that we're not saying to our neighbors that they can't hang around a food source because that's exactly what a food source does. It brings people together. So we're constantly adapting, you know, like I said, as the weather gets warmer and as COVID things lift, we really want to paint the fridge and we want it to reflect uh, our community's dynamic and our community's um, personality. So we're going to call out for neighbors to come help us do that and local artists to come do that. We had a health center in Kitchener last year, last summer, when we were getting started, reach out to us and say they wanted to host a community fridge in their health center. So, you know, we might revisit that conversation if they want to get another community fridge started. We're discussing food partnerships with community gardens as the weather gets warmer. Um, so lots of constant future goals, but uh, the one future goal that is definitely static and uh, stagnant in place is responding to need. Thanks, Amy. 
We've got about 10 minutes left. So feel free to share your thoughts, comments, questions. Even if you don't have a question and you just want to have some dialogue, feel free to chime in. More of a more of a comment. I found it really interesting that I I almost assumed at the start of your presentation, I would hear the not in my backyard aspect of things. And to hear that it kind of was larger corporations or that element of things really, I was like, oh, it really threw me for a loop on it a little yeah. bit. That's, that's not the angle I expected here. Yeah, thank you for raising that, Bruce. And you're right. That's like when I said we were anticipating pushback and we were anticipating resistance. You're exactly right. We were anticipating resistance from neighbors. We were anticipating resistance from citizens um, saying, you know, this isn't something that I want to see. This is somewhere that I access my daily groceries. I don't want to be seeing this. But it was completely different. And you know, once again, if I have to think about a positive outcome of the pandemic, it's this um, accelerated, obviously accelerated challenges, but the outcome of that has been accelerated empathy and accelerated understanding and, um, you know, this radical inclusion and radical love that people are experiencing and feeling and that might be because they're missing it from their own lives or they're seeing how much pain and hardship exists in our communities and, you know, who can say it not in my backyard when there are so many challenges in our backyard that we can be part of. And, and, you know, people really see their role in it. People really see how they can be part of this and get involved. And uh, something that I say to my, I say to our volunteers all the time is people are good. People are good. People are good. Um, and that's something that we've had to learn through this project that people are good. People want to do good. Uh, people want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. People, not all people might have the privilege of starting it though. Not every person has the, you know, uh, time and there's resources and the skills to be able to put this in action and to make it work. But we go back to those multiple points of entry points that people are good. If you create something that has points of entry ways, people want to be a part of it. So uh, I think the fact that we have not had that type of resistance speaks volumes to uh, where our communities are at in this time, but also how we've invited the community members into this space. Um, and yeah, so that resistance has really just been at the institution level, uh, and even that has really diluted and kind of fizzled away, but um, like I said, with any type of radical change comes uh, an educational curve, and you know, if we as individuals are having a hard time shifting our mindset from charity to mutual aid, can you imagine the actual charities who own their charities who have to shift that perspective? So uh, we're here, we understand, we're here to walk with everybody. Absolutely. It speaks volumes for the community and where where we place that. So it's 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 a nice micro and macro example, real world example of it. So it's nice to yeah. hear that. Thank you. No, thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Um, Sarah, no need to apologize. Uh, I'm homeschooling. Shout out to parents everywhere. You folks are absolute bosses during this time, like incredible work. Huge round of applause to parents everywhere. Uh, but what does Community Fridge 2.0 look like? So we don't know. We don't know what Community Fridge 2.0 looks like because uh, we haven't heard from the neighbors or the community about what it should look like. Uh, we know that, like I said, we will respond to need. If someone reaches out and says we need a community fridge in our neighborhood, we'll absolutely explore that. And we might open a second community fridge in that neighborhood. Um, you know, someone reached out to me just yesterday who said that they would love to explore a community fridge in the Stanley Park area. And you know, I'm never going to shut that idea down, but I'm also not going to instantly say yes to it because we have to determine that there is need there and that we have to determine there is community buy-in there for long-term sustainability. So it's not about me, it's about the impact. Um, so Community Fridge 2.0 will look like what you want it to look like. So reach out and stay tuned and um, get involved. Um, yes, Emily, I agree with you. I recommend that you keep your project focused on mutual aid as a charity that can help with the education piece of this puzzle. It is awesome to see how people have connected with that they have reached out to support this project. Yes, absolutely. Great example of innovation in our region. I completely agree. Thank you, Emily. I'll give a couple minutes if anyone else has thoughts or questions or comments or concerns. But either way, thank you all so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you being part of this conversation and the conversation doesn't have to end here. Um, you are more than welcome to connect with me with you know, the links in my profile or community fridge. The email is in there. Um, and I'm super, super eager to get to know all of you. Huge shout out to the Youth Leadership Auto of the Region for having me today. Uh, thank you so much, Bruce, for being the handler and organizing and helping me focus on the presentation. 
Um, and hopefully when things are better, we will all get to see each other in person, um, meet around the fridge uh, and gather once more. But in, in the meantime, we will continue to support each other in the ways that we have been. Thank you for thank you for all that you just did. It's uh, it's so nice to hear the passion and the excitement and the the goods and the bads of your story. It really, it really is uh, invigorating and like I I love hearing the passion in your voice. Um, uh, I can I'll thankfully speak on behalf of everyone in the room. I I really really enjoyed it. I would assume most people have multiple notes of pages like I do, takeaways of little nuggets of information. Same. <laughs> I know I filled up an entire tablet page of it. So I really appreciate all the hard work you're doing and continue to continue to do. Um, and yeah, like you said before, in the, the HOVA app, don't forget that you can uh, directly message you or send an email connected to you. Um, you and myself are around if there's anything that people need to ask questions for or want to more clarity on, then um, by all means, reach out. Um, but other than that, I believe, unless there's any last minute questions. Yes, Amy, huge shout out to Amy for, for making that connection about monetary donations. You know, I still get messages every week from people saying I'd love to donate money. And um, I always start that conversation with what else can you donate? <laughs> um, <laughs> it sounds very like selfish, but uh, we're really just getting, we have that conversation to think about their skills, their gifts, their abilities, um, besides just their money. And, you know, sometimes money is a gift. It absolutely is a way for you to show your support. But we really want to get to the fact that us as neighbors have the ability to come together uh, with what we already have. You know, what's in our backyard, what's in our brains, what's in our hearts. Um, so that individual who messaged this week said that they wanted to donate money. We had a conversation about what else they can donate. And turns out they've got a lot of hand sanitizer. And I want that hand sanitizer for the fridge. So uh, they're going to be donating hand sanitizer to the fridge. Uh, and, you know, that's an expense that we don't have to make now. So huge, huge point, Amy. Thank you. Thank you, everybody else in the comments. I really appreciate it. Yes, we'll see what happens in the next six months. Stay tuned. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Thanks, Bruce. Okay, so if is that? Yep, you're, I think you're all caught up. Beautiful. Good job. <laughs> um, okay, so the, I, I believe the next piece is at 2.45 if everyone... Uh, wants to grab a drink of water or come come check us out over there. I'm sure the actual awards itself will be just as invigorating. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks Have a again, great rest Camille. of your day, everybody. You too. Bye.